going to be a uh, it's going to be talk about uh, my experiences with social media as like a, kind of a way to get ideas and kind of interact with people, as well as my experience doing a Kickstarter project or two. Um, I imagine quite a few of you guys might have questions on your own about like uh, uh, using either of those things. So after I'm done kind of talking about my experiences and kind of sharing a few tips, I, I'd be glad to kind of really get in. I'm very opinionated about like Kickstarter versus Indiegogo or, or um, any of that stuff. So we can totally do Q and A if you guys have specific questions on what to do with your projects. But uh, just to just to tell you guys about myself, I'm uh, not actually a doctor. Uh, so if anything goes wrong, do not talk to me about like heart surgery or anything. Uh, and I guess uh, never take my opinion as medical advice. Uh, I've been making zines for 20 years, zines and comics. I actually realized this yesterday. Uh, I was 16, uh, made a fake newspaper with some friends, uh, like a not so funny, funny newspaper. Uh, but then after that, I uh, got into like doing zines about bands and stuff like that. I'm from Tennessee and uh, zines was uh, my only source of like outside information about like what's happening beyond uh, the small farm town I was from, uh, and it was our way also of telling people that things were happening in small farm towns other than uh, small farms. Uh, at dot pop is uh, my handle on Twitter or Instagram or just about anything. Um, uh, I actually started using at dot pop uh, and, and Twitter uh, back when I was a, a professional yo-yoer. I got really into this idea of, uh, yo-yoers are really, this is the nerdiest thing you're going to hear. Yo-yoers are very tech-savvy people when it comes to like uh, internet culture. Um, I would say uh, maybe car modifiers and stuff like that were also there with this, but like in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were like really trying to figure out how to get the best videos to share our tricks with each other and how we could start streaming contests before I really saw anybody kind of streaming contests or streaming events. Um, as, as commonly as they are now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, nerdy tech people. Actually, one of my friends, Harper, who was a, a you know, yo, -yo, yo yo hacker back then, is now Obama's CTO in charge of like all this tech. So like a lot of people got into film or got into all sorts of cool technology. But the thing that I really got into uh, was, was, was sharing contest events as soon as I could. And Twitter was like perfect for that. Um, the, uh, the idea that uh, usually you would sit up front with a, with a camcorder, uh, record a contest, come home and process everything, cut it up into videos, where I could just be up there right up next to the judges and like sharing stuff on Twitter, like blah, blah, blah. This was, uh, when I got my first iPhone, this was the National Video Contest, and uh, I shot a guy uh, during the National Video Contest. This guy was one nationals uh, at the end of the day, and I was sharing it on Twitter and like people were using hashtags for the first time. That was really cool for me. So um, that was pretty addictive and it wasn't long before I started trying to figure out how I was gonna merge uh, my art and social media. 24-hour um, comic book day happens once a year. It's a group of cartoonists get together, and draw in a room like this and spend 24 hours trying to make something without any preconceived ideas. Um, during my 24-hour contest, or 24-hour uh, 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 comic day uh, in 2007, yeah, I think that's uh, I just tweeted this thing. I'm drawing robots, kind of sketching stuff. And I tweeted this, uh, uh, robots don't know anything about blank. And I didn't really have any ideas what I was going to do with that. I didn't think it was going to be much. But it turns out that this, this tweet uh, got lots of replies, more than pretty much anything else I've done. Um, so all of a sudden, I started getting people saying robots don't know anything about cooking, and robots don't know anything about making comics, and robots don't know anything about this and that. So I quickly realized I could scrap everything I was working on and just make comics out of each tweet that I got. So every single person that tweeted me, uh, robots don't know anything about love, for instance, would become uh, a panel, like just a one page of comic. Uh, it's not you anymore, space. That way. Uh, so yeah, there was there was all sorts of tips, and it was really it was really fun because it was very instantaneous. You know, you're in a room for 24 hours, and you're not really talking to the people next to you, except occasionally you take your headphones off and you kind of take a break. But throughout the day, I was just checking Twitter, and I would see more and more replies, and I was able to kind of work them into pieces. And then obviously, the people who were replying, they, they didn't know I was even working on a comic like this. It wasn't the goal I set out to do, but once they did, they were really into it. And I really liked that feedback that all of a sudden, uh, a comic I was making in 24 hours had like at least 24 people who really cared about it. You know, that was more than usual for me. So uh, that was my first experience kind of working with, with uh, 
using social media to crowdsource ideas. I, I tried it again a couple years later when Instagram came out. Um, and uh, the results were, were pretty different. They were, uh, so this time, you know, uh, 30 minutes before the challenge, or like maybe right, right when the clock started, uh, I posted a picture and said, you know, use hashtag Instagram and share a photo uh, that you think would work in a comic. And I don't know what the comic's about yet, but I'll try to work it into something. Uh, and that worked okay. The response was, I just barely got like 12 responses, uh, but uh, I did more of a linear style uh, comic instead of page by page. I tried to actually kind of make things kind of make sense together. Uh, and uh, 24 hour comics is not about making good comics, it's just about like finishing something. So, in that sense, it's a success. But it was pretty interesting to me to kind of compare uh, my Twitter experience from 2007 and my Instagram experience for, you know, making comics uh, and just see that there just didn't seem to be that interest. And I, I guess the, the things I kind of learned about that was uh, uh, social media is entirely unpredictable. Um, you can never go out and say, I'm going to do this thing because you never have any idea if there's going to be a war that breaks out or a nipple slip or if there's just going to be something that happens that no one cares about what you're doing. Uh, and other times, uh, you know, it's a slow news day and all of a sudden, People are just like more than eager to kind of get involved in it. So as I kind of did more and more of these, I realized that it's good to be uh, to be nimble, uh, to really have no ideas other than maybe I want to try to work with these folks and try to do something. But if that doesn't work, you know, figure out something else. Or if it goes in a different direction, if people keep making jokes about transformers and you're trying to do something uh, about like uh, you know nature or elves or whatever, just you know go with it or whatever. You can't really control. And that's kind of you know the point of both 24-hour comic book day, which is all about letting go of uh, you know notions of just making something, but also the, the whole idea of crowdsourcing. You really don't know what you're going to be getting at. Uh, oh, also Zay Frank is the king of uh, crowd uh, crowdsourcing. Uh, if you guys are ever kind of just in the mood to get inspired by a community, uh, Zay Frank does amazing things. Uh, some ideas, for instance, that he's come up with. And, and by the way, uh, if you're if you're working on crowd, crowdsourcing ideas for like a comic or a zine, you just have to get used to the fact that Zay Frank will beat you at everything. Mm -hmm. uh, he did uh, a great project called Young Me, Now Me, uh, which is just, you know, old pictures of people, and then they, uh, you know, as, as children, and then they try to reenact the pictures with clothes or whatever they can to get as similar as they can. This is one of his projects that went viral. Um, the thing that you can learn from Zay Frank, uh, uh, and the thing that I've kind of figured out is, is social media is unpredictable, but if you do enough projects, something might actually work out. You might actually catch a spark of people. So it's not an idea of like, uh, I'm going to do this big project, but if you want to work with social media, you just got to do a bunch of things and just see what works and what doesn't. Um, and sometimes you can try the same thing twice, like just a month later, and it may be a big hit the second time. You know, and it wasn't a total waste, it was just for whatever reason it didn't click the first time. Zay Frank does, I'd say, probably four projects a month. Uh, a little music project, a little video project, some sort of like new micro site that's just like, just you go to it and it just says, is it, you know, was the sun out today? And it says yes or whatever. Just really simple things. And occasionally one of those things really catches on. It's just the, the sheer volume of what he does. Um, and working with crowds, you just throw out a lot of nets and see what you can catch. Um, it was just a matter of time before I got into uh, Kickstarter. Uh, as soon as I heard about it, I, I kind of uh, was intrigued, but it took me a couple years, I think three years after its launch before I did my first Kickstarter. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the very oldest Kickstarters I could find. Uh, back when $4,000 was a, a ton of money uh, for, for Kickstarter. Uh, the, the, the projects that you kind of see on Kickstarter are, are pretty, pretty cool stuff. A lot of people think of Kickstarter as being uh, a way to sell a gadget. Um, I know there's been a lot of million dollar like watches and billion dollar uh, you know, eyewear or whatever that are technological things. Uh, it turns out that in the large scale for Kickstarter, those are very small. That's not their biggest, uh, their biggest category. What they do the most of up until this year was film and plays. That was their number one category. And you never hear about uh, a million dollar film or well, I guess it was just the Buffy one or uh, the Zach Braff as well. Uh, but Again, in the large scale, you never really hear about the bulk of their successes, which are really in the $4,000 to $5,000 range. That's where most of their money comes from. Uh, the guys at Kickstarter, I have a couple of friends who work there, 
internally, they're trying to figure out how to get rid of the projects that are products because they don't like they don't like the ad, the atmosphere they have of being a, a pre-order platform for gadgets. Um, but that's I think how a lot of us think of it. Uh, speaking of which, that's how I think of it. Um, most of the things that I back on Kickstarter are pre-order. They're artistic projects, but they're at the core of the pre-orders. You're not donating money, usually. Uh, this is uh, my book, American Analog. Um, my goal was to put out a, a photo book um, using uh, analog film, which I've been shooting for about a year, and I really wanted it to be a physical book. It's, you know, it's analog film, so it's got to be an analog result. Um, and so I used Kickstarter to, to fund the first two issues, and the second issue is coming out soon. Um, this went live in January. I had a, a very modest goal of $5,000, which was, like I said, paid for two issues, not for like one issue. Uh, and met the goal, didn't really exceed it uh, too much. Uh, the, the project got funded, but I'll consider it a success, and I hope that if you guys are doing Kickstarters, you consider your project a success once you've shipped it. So I still have one more issue to go, and then all my, all my backers are happy. Most of my backers have gotten uh, most backers back just the first issue. They've all gotten their first issue back in March, I guess, is when this came out. Um, this is all San Francisco. The next one's going to be all New York. Um, I, I learned a lot while working on this project. I, I wanted to do a small project just in case things went bad uh, so I wouldn't be too screwed. Um, if you guys have backed a lot of Kickstarter projects, you'll have seen a lot of failures. Uh, I didn't want to be one of those. Uh, so this was a very realistic project. But to be honest, my favorite projects to fund are the ones that fail, as long as they share their examples. Uh, one of my favorite projects is, it's not a complete catastrophe, but uh, it's called Socrates, and it's a guy who decided he wanted to use Teflon yarn to make socks, because it's good enough for, you know, stopping bullets or whatever. The Teflon stops bullets, right? Or is it uh, Kevlar? Kevlar. Yeah, you use Kevlar for, for socks. Like, these are going to be the longest lasting socks ever. And you know, and socks are five bucks. That's too much. But it's all for two fifty or whatever. And uh, he's a really friendly guy. And he's very transparent. And the fact that his project is a year and a half late doesn't bother me because the stuff I've learned about socks and manufacturing is so cool. Like you just don't even think about this stuff. Like you know, why don't they make couches for cheaper or whatever? I can do that. I'll do a Kickstarter. And then you see someone do it, and you're like, oh, this is why. It, it turns out uh, this Kevlar yarn. You, you know, big shock, it ruins machines that are meant to, to work on socks. Uh, so they're, they're figuring that out, and it's really cool stuff. It's, it's, it's got to be really humbling to be on one of those projects that kind of goes bad. Uh, the things I learned from my project, uh, kind of the post-mortem, uh, were, and by the way, this is one of my favorite pages from the zine that someone, one of my recipients shared. Uh, the day I launched my Kickstarter, USPS International Shipping more than doubled. Shipping to Canada was three fifty. Now it's just nine forty five, um, and I mean, it's just in Canada. Uh, UK is the same price, nine forty five. I mean, it, it doubled. Um, pretty much all my international shipping went from an average, and I, I was really diligent in getting my, my shipping quotes and everything. Uh, it went from being between three to four dollars to nine to ten to fifty. Uh, not to mention the envelopes I was packing in, which I really wanted to have nice, you know, silk screen envelopes and all this stuff. So, uh, so I lost money on all my international orders, just, just a tiny bit. Technically, I lost about 50 cents per issue, uh, and so basically that's breaking even. I can't really complain. That helped me reach my goal. I appreciate their support, but that was a painful lesson. And that was really, there's nothing I can tell you to, to prepare for that, because who, who knows that international shipping is going to double the day you launch your product. Mm -hmm. um, my higher tier levels, this is the one that really surprised me. I don't. I don't think I can see them here, but my uh, higher tier levels, you want to have tiers. Uh, one of the reasons you want to have tiers for projects is to make your target tier seem like the best pricing option. This is the, you guys probably heard of the old stereo um, kind of pricing technique where they'll have the $150 stereo and like the $1,000 stereo. This is amazing, but you know, you could have this one and, and all of a sudden 150 seems really reasonable, you know, for what you're getting versus 150 being the top. So using that logic, I wanted to have a uh, $1 just thanks for your donation, $10 for one zine, $25 for two zines, which was really my, my target price range. That was what I wanted most people to go for. And $50 for a larger print of two zines, and $100 for a canvas print, a hard canvas print, and two zines. Um, it turns out my $100 for, for the, the, 
canvas print was $68 for the canvas, which I knew. Um, you, you guys won't believe this, but it was about $8 for the little cardboard box to hold it. And then shipping was another 10 bucks. And I have to ship both issues, which one issue I can include, but the other issue still has to be separate. It turns out I made less on my $100 level. Uh, I made uh, five to 10 bucks profit on that, where my $25 level, I have had it in about five bucks per issue. So I actually made less on my higher books. So if I were to do this again, I think I was just thinking like, 100 bucks is really expensive. I really shouldn't ask for more than that. But there's people out there who want to just give you a fair price for something, and I really should have, I shouldn't have undercut myself. If you're gonna have a higher level, you don't wanna, you don't wanna make less on it, you know, then why even have it, right? Like I should have had people pay the $25. Uh, physical goods suck. Um, my one goal, and I've talked to so many Kickstarter projects, and the one thing I tell them is don't do physical, but they're just like me, and, and I understand the mentality, and it's just, I don't know how to fix it, but I wanted to make an analog book for analog film, and it turns out that, that a lot of people really like digital, but also shipping things for 10 bucks for just a couple bucks profit, you know, total, like, per thing, and when it's all done, my profit is so low. If I would have sold a $10 digital or an $8 digital file, or $6 digital file, I might have doubled or tripled the number of, of sales I actually had, and not had the cost at all, so it would have been pure profit, and the ease, you know, there wouldn't be people writing from Australia saying their scene hasn't come yet, it's been two months. Uh, like, I, I don't know how to fix that problem if you really, really, really want to do a physical item, but the one thing I can say is make sure it's worth your time. Uh, if you have two ideas for projects, and one's a $10 project, and another one's a $25 project, but they're, you know, physical, make it worth your time. You're the bigger project. Don't, don't go through a lot of work to ship something really small. It's, it's, a, it's really heartbreaking. <laughs> it, it's really good because it helps get this thing out, and I have it, and I can tell it to table it, and it wouldn't have existed probably had I had to find it myself, but, um, if, if I had to do it over again, I would have talked myself into doing an album or some sort of digital project. Um, the, the things that do work, so that's, those are the things that kind of went wrong with my project. The things that do work is um, popularity with, with, uh, with crowdfunding isn't as important as a lot of people think. Uh, a lot of folks tell me uh, that you know, they want to do a crowdfunding project, but they don't have as many followers as I have. I only have 7,000 followers on Twitter, which is not a lot these days. Uh, uh, that's, a lot of those are probably dead accounts. You know, my response is not super, super hot. I don't have like, an army of people that I can say go by this thing. But even so, 7,000 followers on Twitter, uh, I think it's 40,000 followers on Instagram, um, and those are people who like my photography, and I, I sold like 140 units of this thing. Um, it's not popularity that sells these things, it's usually a good story, a, a good product as well, but a, a good story. By a good story, I mean something that's very easy to describe to people and they can quickly tweak and share with themselves. If they can't understand it, and if they can't, if they can't share it, then it's, it's maybe not gonna do super well. No matter how popular you are or how many people like you, you still have to have something that's just got uh, a story. Like for instance, uh, I'm gonna show you guys some examples of good stories. But my story was a little convoluted, I think. It was very hard to explain. Um, I wanted to do a film zine. I wanted to do a film photo zine. And I thought that was pretty self-explanatory, but a lot of people didn't know what zines were. Uh, and there was a lot of other things where people were like, well, you know, we're, well, how do I get the digital file, whatever. It wasn't a good story. I think that's one of the reasons it didn't do as well as some of the other projects I wanted to do. Um, and, and I'll show you guys some, some really, really good stories uh, on the next drafts. But, um, one of my favorite tips to give to people who are working on Kickstarter projects is create a draft early. And you can create a draft in a text file or in an email that you kind of send to yourself and kind of tweak every now and then. But Kickstarter actually allows you to create as many drafts as you want. They even call them drafts. They're not like, a, you know, launch your project. It's not a big, scary thing. Um, they're even talking internally because they want to get more people doing uh, one to $5,000 projects. They want an army of people doing that, less big projects. So they're trying to get people after they funded three projects, they're just gonna show them a little thing saying, hey, write down an idea for a project and they'll kind of automatically create it. And I hope they do because it shouldn't be as scary as I think a lot of us think it is. Um, you can create a draft, you can create mini drafts. I have a couple projects, I didn't take screenshots of them. Uh, I have a project for a video game uh, music album that some friends and I are talking about working on. 
And just to, just to kind of get it on there, I have an actual draft that looks like a Kickstarter project with a title. There's no video, you can save that for last. But you know, your, your great little paragraph, your rewards. And the good thing about doing this is, as you're looking at other Kickstarter projects a month later, you might see the way that they write their rewards is really clever. You know, um, instead of like a big long list, maybe they call it the gold level or whatever, and you say, I want to do that. It's a great way for you to kind of constantly come in and revise things, and you can share the drafts with people when you're kind of getting closer to launch. Um, so I actually have two drafts right now. I have uh, a video game project, and I have a, a, a draft for a Kickstarter project to make denim coffee cozies, which I think is an awesome idea, right? Like think about how many cozies you throw away every year if you're a heavy coffee drinker. They just fit in your pocket, they're reusable, they age well. You know, it's a, it's a good story to me. The thing is, these are $10, and I was just saying how much I really, really, really hate shipping things for $10, so I don't know if it's gonna happen. But like, just having those drafts is the best thing you can do just to kind of really have a project ready to go. As much as you think about a project, it's always close to launch day that you realize you really didn't think about higher reward levels. Like when I launched my project, I only had the $25 was, was the highest level, and I had people saying, what else can we get, or whatever. Um, had I had more time, I actually did reach some people, but uh, I would have worked with um, filmmakers and camera makers and like gotten rewards. I actually did get some from Lomography, gave me two $250 uh, cameras for free just to help promote my project, so that was a tier. $250 gets you one of their cameras for the normal price, but the, the, the money is going to help fund my project, and you get this. So had I had more time thinking about drafts, had I actually done that thing and thought about higher rewards, I probably could have talked to all sorts of people about that. Um, we were talking about stories. I'm going to show you like three examples of some favorite stories I have. Now, uh, stories uh, don't have to actually be a thing you read on the screen. It's just kind of the idea you have. Like, oh, that's a good story. I really like that idea. You know, somebody wants to make something. This one is, um, so you have a couple places where your description is going to be. It's either going to be in the title, which is Cards Against Humanity, it's going to be somewhere in the video, or it's going to be in this first paragraph. Uh, and this paragraph is also awesome. Cards Against Humanity is a free party game for horrible people. That's the best description ever. I think, I think like, all of my friends are just like, yes, take all of my money. I'm a terrible person, and I'm a free party game. Um, this, this project uh, has gone on to be even better after it got launched. It's a huge success now. Um, 15000 at the time was considered a success, but it sold millions of dollars now. Uh, that's a great story. It's really simple. They have 140 characters for this paragraph, and they, they only use 60 um, or so. Uh, and that's great. And when you're coming up with that paragraph, that, which is a pretty important thing, the, it's basically the description of your project in a nutshell. Uh, I like to write it, uh, I like to open up a tweet and write it in Twitter, um, because it's 140 characters, it's about that size. And, and it sort of feels right. If you tweet a lot, um, you're sort of used to sharing ideas or whatever. If you can convey your project really efficiently in there, then you're right. Um, but if you have some really convoluted description of what your thing is, other people are going to have a hard time also explaining what it is. So this is a good example, really simple. And then later, you can go down and get into what the game is. But um, this one, Amanda Palmer, her video tells you kind of what, what her story is. Her story is she was trapped under the thumb of a record label. She wanted to make something with her fan support. That's it. Like, I mean, I could go on and say she wanted to do a tour and she wanted to put out, you know, videos and all that. But really, her story was that, you know, I want to do this without the label. And that's a really powerful story. And I'm really connected with her fans. Not the first million dollar project, but I think it was the third. Um, and then, uh, this is the final example, and this is actually, there's still three days left in this. This is my friend Dean's project. Um, he found his grandfather's World War I photos, uh, and he wants to create like a scrapbook for other people for World War I enthusiasts. And just that, that whole idea of like, you know, a grandson finding these photos. And like, in one of the photos, it's like uh, some soldiers in a trench playing cards, and they have like a little coffee cup with like a dandelion growing out of it, like a little plant like growing out of it. And it's, it's such a, like, it's such an amazing kind of like, oh, that's right, like, like the other people went to war than Americans, and this is kind of like uh, a different perspective on it. And, you know, that's just a really powerful story, like, it's, you know, we, we don't all have, like, grandfathers who took photos in the war, but there's usually a really interesting perspective you can put on to what you're trying to make, your art project, you know, a book or whatever, that, that makes it connect to people more than just a literal description of, I'm trying to make a comic book, and I need to use a book. 
So yeah, that's that's just my tips and my experiences with uh, uh, the book. And like I said, um, this is my first project. As soon as that next issue ships, which uh, should be, I'm hoping next month, uh, that'll be the New York book. Uh, I'm gonna start. I'm going to launch one of those other, I'm going to have two or three draft projects. I'm going to see which one seems most realistic, which one has me most interested, and I'm going to hit the start button and uh, see how that does. Uh, but yeah, that's my experience so far. Um, did you guys have any questions about like crowdfunding? Let's talk about crowdfunding first. Or not crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. Sorry. Oh. If anybody, if anybody crowdsources anymore. I'm just shy about having failure. Like, like, I think they're posted online forever. When you try to do something, and if you have a project failure, you're always shy about doing another one. Have so, you found a reputation on, yeah. on Kickstarter? Is that, is I, that a bad thing? I don't think so. I know um, I've backed 120 Kickstarter projects, um, and I've seen I've seen all sorts of stuff, uh, and I've seen some get pulled because they were nefarious. They they clearly weren't being legit. Um, that can ruin your reputation. Uh, I saw one of my first, for the first time ever, I saw a project that was actually boasting in its first paragraph that this was our third attempt to launch that project, which was pretty shocking to me because I always thought like that's like a black black mark, you don't want to miss that. But what they did was they turned it into, you know, um, they, they were actually really straightforward about it, which is the way to do it, being really honest, really transparent. They said the first time we ran into a copyright issue, and by the time we could fix it, you know, we lost all our steam. Um, the second time, you know, we, we realized that we just were asking for too much money and you know, blah, blah, blah. And this time we have everything to, like, we've tried this project three times. We have the research. We've done the, you know, they actually listed, like, their manufacturing costs. They, what they did was they took it as a way to say, we know this project and we know we can make it work and, you know, we're passionate about it. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting. I had never seen anybody post about it. Um, a big fear for people is launching a project and it fails. And there's a couple of things about that. One is you want to make sure your project is, if you're worried about that, make sure that goal is realistic in both senses, that it's going to make you the money you need, but also um, it's going to be as low as possible. But the other is you can't really worry about that stuff in general. You know, a lot of programmers I know don't want to, they have a finished iPhone app that they don't want to put on the store just because it might do bad. But like, you have to, I mean, it's almost best to start with a failure and just get that through. But it doesn't show, you can track failures on Kickstarter, you could like click on someone's bio and then click through and see the projects they've done and then click through in each project and see how much it raised. But that's like four clicks. Uh, hardly anybody goes at them. Um, I don't think it's as big of a stain as we tend to think it is as creators. It seems like the worst thing in the world is a creator. But um, in the bigger scheme of things, if your project, if you do have a project that goes well, Usually it's going to be because it reached people who have never heard of you. It's reaching that second tier of people, not your friends, but their friends or their friends' friends, or people who read about it in the paper or whatever. And they're, they're not going to know anything about you other than that project you have at that moment. So as scary as it is, it should never keep you from doing a project because worst case it fails and then you just, you've learned so much on how to you know, do the next one. Is it better to have a network of friends, a network of people that you expect Start helping you start your project before you submit your project, or let's say you only have like 100 friends. You know, is it better to wait till you have a thousand before you start something, or to? It, it's it's um one bit of advice I've heard, and I, I didn't do this with my project. I kept my project really secret until I launched it. I just wanted to see how it did kind of on its own, and then it didn't do very well. But I had to tap my friends. <laughs> um, but uh, one thing I've heard is that it's good to drum up for a month that you're going to be doing a Kickstarter. It seems a little weird, um, but I think it's worked pretty well for people. Uh, that, that World War One book, he was working on it for about three months. He had his draft folder and he was constantly sharing it with me for revisions and stuff. But uh, he was telling his kind of bigger friends who had good influence a month from now, three weeks from now, two weeks from now, one week from now, tomorrow I'm launching. And so he launched with a really good launch. Um, but generally, um, your friends are going to back it no matter what. I guess it's good to get it in early if they are. Let them know, and you know, have a good start. Uh, it's good advice. Yeah. The earlier, the earlier, I guess you tell anybody, the better. Because then, if it takes them a week to tell their friends, at least it's still time. Okay, I'm going to ask you the same question. Because I'm very ignorant about sure, this sure. stuff. Sure, um, sure. If you wanted to do Kickstarter, which I'm not saying that's what you want to do yet, 
Um, and you have a project. And you create a blog. I don't know how you get people to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So you have to do Twitter to do that? You don't have to. Um, this is interesting. I never thought about how how to make a project successful if, if like, just would, would know, like, the idea that, like, maybe you just landed, it was your first day on Earth, and you have a killer project. Right. How do you do that? Yeah. Just, yeah. I do you know how to do this. Yeah. Do you? Um, you find niche bloggers who um, work in uh, the area that, that your project is in. And so if it's a project that's surrounding history, you go to history bloggers. If it surrounds women's issues, you go to women bloggers. And you just email them. And you write a very short, concise email uh, with a link to your project and tell them if they have any questions, that you're available, and just try to get them to write about you. On their blog. Yes. And, and depending on your project um, and what it is, this advice can go even a little further. <coughs> like, um, instead of going to bloggers, you might go to manufacturers. If, if there's some sort of connection, like if you're using a certain type of camera like I use, mm -hmm. you, know, you might talk to the manufacturer a certain type of film, you might talk to them. And they have people who, it's their job as community managers to find super users and to kind of help them make a story. Instead of saying all the time, buy our camera, buy our camera, buy our camera, they are much more anxious to get people to say, um, look, they used our camera to make this thing, help them make it work, you know, mm -hmm. like we're a community and we all shoot this camera, so let's do it. So, and who would they be and say you, had, you were using the media camera? Um, well, you just, you just find their website uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, try writing to them. Uh, write to them any way you can. You don't have to have a lot of uh, friends on Twitter or friends on Facebook to, to use those, to reach out to people. Mm -hmm. And if it's a good company, usually, uh, they'll have somebody who's very responsive and they'll message you back. Um, who would you, you go to? Because well, you would just write, you would write, like, uh, you write to, uh, you know, at Lamia or whatever their username is on Twitter. You would just, like, write to them on Twitter. Uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't try to find the right person, like, on the back end on the website necessarily. Right. You would just, just post on their Facebook wall yeah. and just post, you know, at apply them on Twitter. And if that doesn't work, try going a little deeper and a little deeper. And if, I mean, eventually, You'll have to say, okay, I guess you're just not checking this or, or whatever. Um, not all companies are super responsive. If you wrote to Ford, you might not get a response. Or if you do, it might be very superficial. Like, yeah, it'll be for you. Um, but, I mean, that, that works really well. If you, can, if you can basically leverage other people and what they do, um, right. along with your project, everybody wins. Um, so with bloggers, that's, that's a, I didn't even use bloggers for, for mine, but that would have been a good way to go. I, I went more to, um, like Twitter groups, uh, you know, like influential manufacturers and stuff like that. And then they disseminated the information and then bloggers who followed them picked it up. And that worked really well. Um, but yeah, there's, there's all sorts of routes you can go. Um, let's say, uh, you know, another thing is, is to, to also just have like a very clear story too. So if anybody does happen to find you, if you do happen to get, you know, the attention of someone, uh, a blogger or whatever, um, Bloggers are very. Are there any bloggers? There might be. Yeah, bloggers are very lazy people. Um, the more work you can do for them, the better. So if you can say um, uh, almost in your first sentence, it's just sort of a, a polite introduction, and then if you can give them something that they can almost repost with very little work, mm -hmm. that that would work really well. Um, uh, I'm lacking for an example here, but, but instead of instead of a very three oh, three paragraph thing. If you can just say almost something that they could just sh mm -hmm. paste, mm -hmm. that tends to work really well. Now, would you go across different blog sites, like Tumblr to yeah, blog spots? Oh no, no, I mean like things. high level blogs that are in whatever your niche is. So like if you, oh. if if it's a comics project, you you look for influential comics blogs or Boing Boing okay. or just sites like that. Um, a, a good example. Uh, you know, is, is FSEB Zine Fest, right? Like they have uh, a Twitter account that's like very, very likely it's followed by a lot of people here. It's growing every year. Um, and they're always hungry for content so that people keep following them. And, mm -hmm. and they don't want really to just repost the same mm -hmm. things. So, you know, if you could just uh, find a way to make your project relevant to them, you know, they tabled at Zine Fest or I'm thinking about tabling at Zine Fest with this project, um, then they'll be incentivized to try to spread the word as well. Mm -hmm. And that may or may not Sometimes that means social media is unpredictable, as I was saying mm -hmm. in the first half. Sometimes you could get picked up on Boing Boing, which is considered a very big blog, and it'll do absolutely nothing for you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then sometimes uh, some uh, mildly influential uh, person on Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus um, might just phrase your project in the best way ever. Like in just one sentence, they may just nail like like yeah. a funny way of saying it, and that could just 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 fuel the, the biggest fire fire you have. So just just aiming for those big ones is is not necessarily the way to go. Because even if you get them, sometimes it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. um, because they're becoming a little stale the way they kind of just there's a project and there's another project. Mm -hmm. um, and what it really takes is for someone to put a personal spin on it with their with their like little touch of approval. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. I hope these people do well. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's like coming from like a Tim Burton or somebody. It's, it's going to be bigger than any blog. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something about you know, signing up for user groups like on Twitter and other social platforms. Is it bad to kind of join and kind of stand on with your project information? There, there's, uh, you, you, there's probably kind of do that because I was thinking about doing that. And yeah. about, you know, what's the, I tell you, if I, I get a lot of auto follows, um, and then you know that tweet that says, uh, "Hey, you support a lot of Kickstarter projects. Like, you should check out ours." I'm, I'm a pretty harsh bastard, uh, and and if it seems like they cut and paste that, if for instance, if they uh, if they have twenty thousand tweets and they've been on Twitter for two days or whatever, yeah, I usually report them to spam. Um, but if you can take a little bit more time and craft something and really pick your targets, you're going to probably do pretty well. Um, pandering towards uh, egos is good, tends to work really well. And you can't do that with cutting and pasting. Um, so if you can really craft something towards that blogger or towards a couple people, I would do that first before you you know, go mass. I mean, you could try mass if nothing else works. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, if you can just find I mean, it takes a lot more work to get, you know, 10 more tweets, or 10 tweets out than it does to just cut the kind of paste. But if you can find a way to make it personal to people, and not just like, you know, I saw you wrote about um, hybrid cars, you know, in 2007, you know, I think you might like this project. Um, but if you can really figure out, like, if it's not, if it's not something you can make click with them, then just maybe not even send it to them. You know, see if you can figure out who is relevant to them. And there's probably other perspectives on that too, but like I said, I'm a harsh dude. I, 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 I keep my spam button very handy. Anybody else out there? Uh, so why Kickstarter over Indiegogo? Okay, yeah. Uh, so there's two platforms out there. Kicks, well, there's more than two, but let's face it, there's two. Um, there's Kickstarter is the first, and it's almost so synonymous, it's like the Kleenex of crowdfunding. It's like a thing that eventually they're going to have to start keeping people from using the term when they're not talking about Kickstarter. Um, it's more it's more prevalent than crowdfunding it's in terms of a term. You know, we, we, we say Google, we don't say Internet Searcher, and we're going to say Kickstarter project when we mean crowdfunding. Um, it is uh, the best place to go, in my opinion. There's only two reasons that I can think of to go to Indiegogo. Um, and, and bless their hearts, they're trying really hard, they're a local company. But the only two reasons you should be on Indiegogo is if you got rejected by Kickstarter, uh, or if you are launching something specific to the Netherlands, or somewhere where, where Kickstarter doesn't exist, right? Because Kickstarter is like, for instance, Canadians just got Kickstarter like access to be able to back stuff. That's harsh. But uh, at the same time, I don't really want to ship internationally, so it didn't bother me too much. Um, Kickstarter versus Indiegogo, your rates are, um, Indiegogo tries to undercut Kickstarter and how much you get and how many fees you pay. They try to be a little cheaper. Um, they also have this thing that some people consider less scary, which is you can choose if you want to be all or nothing or if you want to just collect everything you get. Um, you guys probably already know this, but if you say I need $5,000 on Kickstarter, if you get $4,500, you don't, you don't fuck. Um, Indiegogo allows you to set early on you know, that I'm all or nothing or not. The thing is, the all or nothing model worked really well for Kickstarter because it, it boosted confidence. A lot of people, if you say I need $5,000 to make a computer um, and then you get $3,000, I, I don't know, I'm a little worried. You know, especially if you're talking about like, you know, I need $10,000, but you only get 200 or whatever. You still keep the money. That's, I, the, the confidence needs to be instilled for the early buyers. So you want to do the all or nothing model. And Kickstarter is just more viral. It's got the um, it's got the longer tail effect of like when I back something on Kickstarter, my friends see it um, through email, maybe on Facebook, 
Indiegogo tries to do something like that, but the way Kickstarter does it is so viral. Um, I'm seeing one project, I've gotten the eighth email about this uh, new Mega Man clone uh, video game coming out. Like, uh, I, I just keep seeing it. I, and I see memes attached to it. My friend Tom's back it. My friend Jeff's back it. Kickstarter is doing really well on all those levels. And, and there are a few projects that have launched on both platforms. Um, there was a, a girl who had a, a, a grandfather who kept spilling his coffee because he was so shaky. So she made a coffee mug with three handles and it was impossible to spill, theoretically. And the, the cutest story, right? Like that's a good story. I'm, I'm making a coffee mug for my grandfather, but I thought other people would like it. And she was featured on Indiegogo and all their links, like on the front page, and Indiegogo did mail, mail blasts and stuff like that. Um, Boston Globe, they were in Boston. Boston Globe featured their, their Indiegogo link. Um, New York Times featured their Indiegogo link, but they were also on Kickstarter. And even without pushing Kickstarter, they did as much or if not more on Kickstarter. Um, just naturally speaking, Kickstarter projects tend to do better than Indiegogo projects. And that'll catch up eventually, but we're not there yet, and there's no reason to be one of the people that helps it catch up. If you don't have to, you could, you could be on the other side. I'm not paid by Kickstarter. That's not like I am wondering if there's a terms of service. When I saw this project on both things, especially when Indiegogo was like featuring it as like, you know, this is the reason we're awesome. Um, I was wondering if they were breaking any terms of service. No one canceled them, but I would be sure that you check the terms of service, which change frequently for Kickstarter. They they have constantly uh, Leaf just had to repost a project because it got it just broke the terms of service that they just had. So we had to modify a slight thing so it sounded more like what they wanted. Um, but otherwise, there's no reason not to be on both. I mean, I guess. Although I've thought about this, like for my next projects, I don't know if I launched on both projects if I would have the all or nothing on Indiegogo, or how I would do that, right? I mean, if I say I need five thousand dollars to do, you know, to buy a machine to get these, I want to give people their money back. But at the same time, I don't want to raise five thousand dollars for platforms or for guys. So that's the only thing to figure out. But as long as you're not breaking the terms of service, I think it's a good idea. Anybody else have any uh, crowdfunding or any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so how do you determine the, the, the costs and the items that you with for rewards? Because that seems to be the big incentive for backers, but that's also an additional cost um, for, for the individual campaign. You, you definitely want to spend, that's one thing um, that I've seen most projects do is they don't calculate the prices um, correctly and they just have to take the hit, and you don't want to be on that side. Um, what you want to do is, is do your research, you know, find more than one source. If you're, if you're manufacturing something and you're going to China to get a USB part, um, custom made out of plastics, find more than one company, don't just go with that one. Um, and get three companies, get three quotes, so you really have a good idea that, that worst case, if, if X falls out, you still have Y and you still have Z. Um, the, uh, the other thing to do is inflate your prices a little bit. When, when I was talking about my, my post-mortem on my project, when, um, when I was figuring out shipping, so I wanted to sell the books for roughly seven bucks each and then three bucks for shipping. So I was kind of thinking $10 was my reward level. Um, and I kind of came to that price uh, when I realized I could get these books for between 150 to 225. Um, 225 was local, 150 was in China. Uh, I ended up going with 225, but like I, so I knew that worst case that was cheaper, um, and uh, I also added a little bit of padding, so I more than doubled it. Uh, instead of just going like five bucks, I just as a safety put seven bucks. And with shipping, I also padded it a little bit for international. Um, instead of asking for five, which would have been more than enough previously, I asked for six, and I still uh, cost nine fifty per. No, no one can see. I was saying earlier, international shipping doubled the day I launched my project. Uh, so that, anyway, um, so you want to pad. You definitely want to pad because you never know what's going to happen. And also because there's no reason to be undercutting yourself. Um, a good rule of thumb uh, is to find out what your wholesale or like what your cost is per item and triple it rather than double it. A lot of people double. Um, I say triple it, because that way you can still go wholesale if you need to, and there's a lot of profit, where if you just double, you won't. So if something costs you five bucks, say it's gonna sell for 15. And just do your research and make sure you have plenty of evidence to support that that, that, that quote isn't crazy, or coming from someone who later on will change their price. 
that answer the questions? Oh, and then I also said earlier, you missed this, um, be sure if you're doing a $100 level, like a high tier, really look at it closely and make sure that that's worth your time because on my high tier, I made less profit than I did on my $25 tier. I wish I would have sold, instead of selling 10 uh, $100 projects, if I sold 10 to 25, I would have made two bucks more, or three bucks more per project. And, and the, people like their canvases they got, and that's awesome. It was a waste of my time. Anybody else have any more questions? I got the dumbest question. Yes. Because I, I don't know if you explained this earlier, um, but how does Kickstarter make its money? Uh, Kickstarter scrapes a little off the top of successful projects. Um, so, their their fees are um, their fees are small, but well, no, not They have a huge staff. Um, but just hosting a video and some text doesn't cost them much. If a project goes well and makes you know one thousand uh, dollars, they get. Uh, can anybody remember the Kickstarter cut? Uh, I think it's like five percent of the project, um, and then Amazon also gets two percent from because they're handling the transaction. Um, so Kickstarter gets uh, a little bit. Bucks on this project, 100 bucks on that project. Um, occasionally, there's a million dollar project. Uh, they have a huge staff. They do a lot of customer service, and now they have about 40 people who actually their full time jobs. They're engineers and they're scientists or they're, they're whatever, right? They're printmakers. They're people who know the stuff. And so, if if, uh, if a project comes through for a new iPhone dock, it goes to the engineer guy, and he says, "There's no way they're going to sell that." Whatever. There was a project on Kickstarter for an anti gravity machine. The guy, the guy has a long history. I, I researched him. He has a long history of like posting about.